Hello everyone. My name is Matthew Tapper and I'm from Culture Amp. Um, today I'm going to talk about making the right way the easy way. How we accelerated the rate at which we could roll out new infrastructure and services using packaged app, reusable, and pre-approved, customizable AWS architectures with observability built in. Um, but before we get into the gory details, some context. So who are we? Culture Amp is the culture-first employee feedback company. We make it easy to collect, understand, and act on employee feedback, allowing companies to better manage the employee experience and turn company culture into a competitive advantage. CultureAmp is a certified B Corp, used by over 2,000 culture-first companies, including Airbnb, Salesforce, Slack, and the Richmond Tigers. So, um, we started in Melbourne, we have offices in San Francisco, London, and New York. Culture Camp, Culture Amp is the um, largest independent employee feedback company. And um, with, our late <laughs> with our recent valuation, we're Australia's latest Aussie unicorn. So there's an, an Aussie unicorn for you. <laughs> so um, stack origins. So like most, we started with a monolith, um, which we've outgrown and we've been breaking apart for a number of years. Um, in trying to break apart the monolith, along with the continued drive for new products and features, we've seen and will continue to see an increase in the number of new microservices that we need to deploy. Our infrastructure is deployed as code, so long as you consider YAML code, and this has been so for a long time. But we didn't start with much infrastructure. We had a monolith. SRE engineers with access to our restricted environments would deploy our stacks and maintain them in our restricted environments. And our CI/CD, envir CI/CD environment would have limited access to update those stacks. Um, this works well for a monolith, but things start to break down when you need to do this for many, many services. Large swathes of YAML tend to be copied and pasted, tweaked and massaged. You need to get these reviewed and approved. And then time needs to be found from a stretched SRE team to deploy these stacks into restricted environments and then create the pipelines to build, test, and deploy to them. Shipping new services was painful. From a security perspective, we need to limit access to our restricted environments. And all new services must go through infrastructure and security reviews. And we do this for good reason. We hold a lot of really sensitive data. Folks, gender identity, their sexuality, how they feel about their colleagues, how they feel about their boss. Our customers need to trust us with their employee data, and their employees need to trust us when providing feedback. Limiting access to our restricted environments and gateway reviews creates blockers. We needed these security principles to remain true and be less or non-blocking. Ultimately, there was this tension between velocity and security, and we needed to find a way to do both well. So, as the SRE team, we needed to move from a blocker, a bottleneck in getting things out, to an enabler. We needed to build the tools to enable folks to do it themselves. Our CI CD environment needed to go from update only to have the ability to stand up infrastructure. We needed to go from YAML engineers to engineers uh, to, to, to building up packaged up and reusable architectures that folks could import. Our teams needed to go from dependent on us to independent, and our approval process needed to go from centralized to inflow and, and decentralized. So in a nutshell, we needed to make it super easy for good code and infrastructure to get into production, and we needed to ensure that bad code and infrastructure couldn't. So oh, I'll skip forward. So what we were aiming for was silky smooth, frictionless deploys of infrastructure and services. And this led to us developing a platform that we call Silk. I'll talk you through the platform, the impact it's had, and the implications on our approach to observability. So let's start with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So what we wanted to do required us to ask a lot more of our CI-CD infrastructure. And to do that required us to grant it a lot more access access to assume roles that allows it to stand up and destroy infrastructure in our production environments. And that comes with some risk. 
So in order to, to help mitigate that, we, we segregate our agent pools. We put a lot of rules in place to control what can run on our agents. And we ensure there's no pathway for unreviewed code to get into production. So at a high level, this is what our, our, our CI CD environment looks like. We use BuildKite. Um, and the agents are running on our own infrastructure. So our environment is made up of multiple auto-scaling pools of CI-CD uh, CI agents. And each step of a CI-CD pipeline needs to run on an appropriate pool. Our pools are segregated into unrestricted, restricted, and super-restricted pools. And each agent pool has a bunch of rules that ensure that only jobs with particular combinations of Git repo, branch, and assumable role can run. So every service we deploy via our CI-CD environment requires multiple roles. Um, roles that allow our build artifacts to be pushed, and a role for every environment that we need to deploy to. And all of these roles need to be assumable on all the right agents. Um, so all this adds a huge amount of complexity uh, when, setting up new service, when setting up new services. And this is what, what the platform automates. So, we have a monorepo responsible for all the prerequisite infrastructure required for our services. Um, and within this repo, we have an application responsible for setting up and maintaining what is allowed to run in our CI CD environment and on what agent pools. So, what we have essentially amounts to full CI CD of our CI CD infrastructure, which is pretty neat. Um, so, next, um, IAM roles and permission boundaries. So, we don't we don't use uh, roles that, are, that provide broad access. Each service typically requires many roles. Within our prerequisite infrastructure monorepo, we have a build roles app and a deploy roles app. The build roles app creates build roles that allow us to push to our Docker registries. And the deploy roles app creates the deploy roles in all our target environments that allow us to stand up the infrastructure and deploy our code. Um, now, some of the co components we, we deploy will require their own roles. And to allow this, our deploy roles need access to create additional roles. And this, prevents, this presents a privilege escalation risk. So security is very important to us, and privilege escalation is a real risk. So when, when you create roles that allow the creation of additional roles. So this is kind of how it works. This is what we're doing. Um, and account first, oh, whoops. <laughs> An account first needs to be bootstrapped with a deploy role, deploy role. This is a role that allows us to create deploy roles, and it's assumed by super restricted agents and allows us to roll out all the roles that we need to all our environments. Um, the deploy roles are assumed by agents needing to deploy our services, and they allow the agents to deploy our services and their infrastructure and any roles that they require. Now, using permission boundaries, we can ensure that the power of the roles that we deploy diminish as we move from top to bottom. Um, they're a bit to get your head around, so I won't go into the mechanics, but if you have concerns around privilege escalation, like we did, they were key in us being able to allow more, um, allow our CI-CD environment to do more. Um, right. Ah, quick recap. So we have all the prerequisites in place to automatically stand up new services in our environments. Um, the CI CD environment is configured to uh, build, test, and deploy new services and infrastructure. And we've created the beachheads in deploy roles in all target environments that will allow us to stand up what we need. What we need. And we control what, what can be deployed and what those deployed things can do with permission boundaries. And this actually makes for a perfect governance gateway. Um, this is the point. We can have escalating approval requirements depending on where you're deploying to. And you've got, um, and it's done via pull request. It's something everybody's familiar with. Um, right, our CDK construct library. So we use the AWS Cloud Development Kit, or CDK, to define our infrastructure. So using the CDK, we can encapsulate our view of best practice as a construct and have that vetted pre-approved, and published. Uh, I think that's where I am. <laughs> we maintain our constructs in a, in, a, in a construct library with CI CD pushing them out to our, our internal package repository. But 
before we go on, let's just look at what the CDK is. So it's a, it's a recent open source framework for, for defining cloud resources in code and provisioning them via CloudFormation. So using a supported programming language, you can model and define reusable cloud components called constructs. These can then be composed into stacks and apps. So if we look at that diagram and we just start in the center and work our way out, cloud resources are buckets, servers, functions, databases, subnets, anything within the AWS ecosystem. Now, a construct is made up of one or more cloud resources, and a construct can import other constructs. So they are composable, and they can be built up to encapsulate really complex architectures. We can package them up and publish them to our internal package repository, making them available for anyone within the organization to import. Um, so the next level up, we have stacks. Everything within a stack is deployed as a unit. It essentially compiles the cloud formation. And then all the resources within that CloudFormation template are, are deployed via CloudFormation. Um, and you can have multiple stacks in your CDK app. So the CDK provides tooling for synthesizing your stacks, synthesizing your stacks, testing them, and deploying them. So it's, it's all in one. But let's, let's take a look at an example. What does a CDK app look like? So this is an example CDK app that would deploy all the infrastructure required for a, for a microservice. So starting at the top, there are a couple of import statements. And on line two, you can see where we're importing a Fargate service construct from our internal package repository. Below the import statements, we're defining an app. We're creating a variable to hold the project name. And then we're creating a class, uh, a stack class. And within that stack class, we're going to instantiate our Fargate service construct, point it to a Docker registry, and below that, we're going to add a load balancer to it and add a Splunk, for, Splunk forwarder to it. Um, so that's about 20 lines of code. That will compile to about 750 lines of cloud formation. So what are we getting for free? What's being built into that construct? So when that, when that compiles to cloud formation, what actually gets deployed? We get the, the ECS service. Uh, created, we get task definitions, we get sensible defaults for everything, so sizing, what subnets to run in. We get auto scaling policies and associated CloudWatch alarms. Um, we said we want a load balancer, so we'll get load balancers, target groups, listeners, DNS entries, and because we wanted it over HTTPS, we'll get certificates created and then we'll have custom resources in the background validating those certificates. Um, we also said we wanted a Splunk forwarder. So we're going to be spinning up a Lambda function. We'll subscribe that to our services log group. It'll pick up all the log events and, and write them across to Splunk, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Essentially, what we've done is we've encapsulated a production-ready service containing our view of, of best practice. Now, while it's not illustrated, this is sort of a cut-down version, but the interface for this construct uh, allows for an awful lot of customization. So you can adjust memory, CPU, scaling thresholds, the, 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 in, the endpoint for your, for your load balancer, etc. So some of the other benefits of using constructs and defining your infrastructure in code is you get the benefit of logic. You can model your infrastructure using object-oriented techniques. It's much more testable. It's much more shareable. You're developing within an IDE, so you get the benefits of code completion and being able to inspect the packages you import. So, but most importantly, it doesn't require a huge amount of context by the developer using it. They don't need an awareness of the entire AWS ecosystem. They can create an app, import a package, have a look at the interface, define it, and be confident that they've got a production-ready infrastructure stack that's ready to be deployed to all our environments. Now, before I jump into how we're building in observability, I just want to quickly mention our, our CLI tool. So whilst we've got automation in place to roll out, to set up our CI CD environment and, and roll out all the roles that we need, we've got this construct library that, that has packaged up architectures to address multiple use cases. It's still pretty hard to set all this up at, you know, from scratch. You kind of need to know how to configure everything and how to, how to get things going. And that's where the CLI tool comes, comes in. So it's, 
It's run from within the user's repo, so once they've created their, their app, they're ready to deploy something, they'll run this, it'll make a bunch of pull requests on the user's behalf to roll out all, uh, to set up the CI/CD environment, roll out all the roles required, and then it will inject an app into the user's repo that will create a CDK app and import one of our internal constructs. So all the developer really needs to do is provide some tags, give it an appropriate name, and from that point, they can deploy to all our development farms, staging, production, as long as they've got the appropriate approvals in place. So, uh, observability. So we've accelerated folks a lot. Getting new services into production could take many weeks, sometimes months, and, and this is now achievable in, in hours. Um, and with, with this, our focus is, has shifted from you know, removing bottlenecks and increasing velocity to how do we manage all of this. Um, and core to this is observability. We need SLOs defined for all our services um, so we can track error budgets and balance feature velocity with our reliability objectives. And there are two sides to this. There's a, there's a whole lot of advocacy and buy-in. You need to spend a lot of time kind of getting all your stakeholders bought into the, the SLO targets that you set for, for yourself. But we also need to make it easy, and that's kind of where I'm going to focus. So let's, let's take a look at some of the ways that we're, we're building an observability. So the absolute basics. So Every, con every service construct we, we, we create automatically has access to pull the New Relic license key from the environment, and it's, ava it's available. So developers don't need to work, you know, do I need to pull it from secret manager or parameter store? Does my service have the right access? That's there by default. So Lambda instrumentation. So um, internally, we have plenty of services that would be better placed running on Lambda. And going forward, we want to take more advantage of it. You know, you only pay for what you use, it's, it's pretty handy. So, however, traditionally, it was quite hard to instrument your Lambda functions with APM. And that's because you run a single request, it terminates, and that, that happens before the APM agent has had a chance to report back to New Relic. Now, New Relic released better support for instrumenting Lambda functions earlier in the year, and this is kind of how it works. So you need to deploy a a log ingestion function provided by New Relic um, into your AWS environments. When instrumenting your own Lambda function, the New Relic events are written to your Lambda's log group as opposed to being posted directly to New Relic. Uh, and now the log ingestion function provided by New Relic can then be subscribed to your log, log group. It will then pick up those events and write them across to New Relic. Um, without you know, it being cut off. Um, so this isn't as simple to instrument. It's not just dropping in a library and, and away you go, um, when compared to, to kind of you know, more traditional applications. So uh, this is an example of, of how we do it, but essentially all we did was extended the, the CDK provided Lambda function. We added a new Relic enabled property on the interface. And when that set to true, we can pull in a bunch of things from the environment, so the license key. I think there's an app, app key and a secret to get distributed tracing working. And then we'll also subscribe the new Relic log ingestion function to your Lambda functions log group. The developer doesn't have to worry about how the events get to New Relic. They can just focus on instrumenting their code. Um, auto creation of dashboards and alerts. So whenever we deploy a new service, we want standard dashboards covering the golden signals, so successful request latency, unsuccessful request latency, uh, saturation, throughput, and error rates. We kind of want that as the starting point. And we also want alerts created. Now, we don't create the alerts enabled by default. They're disabled. Um, we don't want to contribute to alert fatigue or make assumptions around what's important. But the, the intent is to bootstrap teams. So they have a useful dashboard from the get-go. But more importantly, the barriers to getting started are much lower. They can start, they've got example queries, and they can start playing and, 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 and customizing dashboards and alerts as desired. So the problem that needed to be solved for this is that when we deploy a service for the first time, the application doesn't yet exist in New Relic. 
So we need to wait for the app to receive traffic, for the agent to then report to New Relic before it turns out, and we can then start calling the API to create the dashboards and all the things we need. So we got this working a couple of weeks ago, um, but essentially what we're doing in the background, we, well, we, we've created a construct that's, that's, that's creating a Lambda back custom resource. So that's spinning up a Lambda function. It'll sit there and wait for the, for the application to become available in New Relic. And once it's there, it'll call the API and create all the things we need. So that's pretty handy. It's, it's a standalone construct at the moment. But once it st stabilizes, we're going to include it into all our service constructs. And we'll get, we'll get dashboards and alerts whenever we deploy a new service. And that will you know, bootstrap teams. Uh, where are we? All right. Sidecar proxies. Um, so what happens if you don't have all your applications instrumented? You know, there are plenty of cases. You might have uh, sort of old or exotic pieces of your stack running unsupported code. Um, you might have an orphaned app running in a corner that, that nobody wants to own, but it turns out it's quite important. Or you might just have teams that, that manage to sneak something past and get something into production that, that wasn't instrumented. So this is something we've been thinking about and playing with. And, and playing with. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're injecting a, a sidecar proxy that sits in front of the service, so between the load balancer and the service, and collects things like um, latency, throughput, error rate, so all the black box metrics for a given service, and reports them back to Neuralic or exposes them via a metrics endpoint. And this ensures that we get a a, a, a base, we can get a baseline of sort of a baseline metrics for all our services, and it removes the dependency on the developers to instrument their apps. So if we've got applications that aren't instrumented, we can, we can turn this on, have the proxy sit in front of it, and at least be getting something. Um, so if we, were, if we were to incorporate this into our internal service constructs, now we wouldn't because they address a particular use case, but if we were, all we'd need to do is ask our teams to bump the latest version of the construct for it to be incorporated. Now imagine doing that in CloudFormation across all, you know, hundreds of stacks. It would be very difficult. So in summary, um, having full CI CD, both application code and infrastructure, with infrastructure defined with code, not YAML, has many benefits. We can build in our view of best practice. And as that view changes, we can have it easily reflected in all our services using those constructs. So we can be opinionated. And we can take away much of the boilerplate and heavy lifting. We've dramatically accelerated our development teams. And we're now improving observability of our services by allowing our development teams to focus on instrumentation and not infrastructure and giving them default dashboards, giving them a head start with default dashboards and alerts. And I think that's it from me. So thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you.